morning and welcome to everyone joining our online service today at Kingsbridge Family Church. Do engage in the live chat with each other and with us. Uh, Gordon will be following that. My name is Ruth and with my husband Bob, we're going to be taking you through the service this morning. I don't know whether any of you have seen that beautiful book commissioned by um, the Duchess of Cambridge called Hold Still. There's some very poignant pictures in that, and one in particular is of a vicar um, preaching to um, photographs in the pews. He actually asked his congregation to send in a photograph of themselves, and that's how we're going to imagine you this morning, sitting in front of us and um, enjoying our time together. But we do acknowledge that this week has been a little bit uncertain and there's been anxiety regarding COVID for many of you. We do particularly think of those who have contracted the virus and we do send our love for a speedy recovery. But we've noticed that you've all shown great support for one another during the week. The help and the guidance with the right testing kits and just those making daily decisions on the safety and our well-being. And God has seen all that. So here we are online as a precaution, I hope, ready to meet with God through the power of his Holy Spirit that joins us together. Our theme this morning is freedom. So we'll try and think the uh, link the great exodus of the Israelites from their captivity in Egypt into their new land with the freedom that Christ has won for us on the cross. The New Testament changes everything. Today is also the start of National Prisons Week, where churches in the country unite in prayer for those in prison, those that work in prison, outside, and also those that have been affected, those by crime, the victims themselves. As you know, Bob and I go into both Channingswood and Dartmoor prisons to support the chaplaincy team. As we make our way to the chapels, several doors close and are locked behind us. This is not a place to have a panic attack. In fact, it's quite disarming and you can't get out quickly. Physically, we have lost our freedom, but we take with us our hearts, in our hearts, the message that crime and sin doesn't have to define us forever. There is freedom from sin and guilt to be found in Christ, which we'll look at a little bit later. So would you like to join me in prayer as we commit this time to God? If you'd like to raise your hands, then do. Father, we raise our hands in humility and all as we come to worship you. You're a good, good father. And we want to meet with you this morning and hear you speak to us. Holy Spirit, would you touch our dear brothers and sisters and family members who we know have got the virus and please restore them to full health. You know how some of us are feeling this morning, perhaps a bit fearful, feverish, adrift, wobbly, and so we need a life jacket and we need your embrace. So we open our hearts to you and surrender in worship. Our freedom in Christ is always worth celebrating. Just going to read to you Psalm 57. Awake, my soul, awake, harp and lyre. 
I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. is just going to come now and share with you. Good morning. Yes, my name is Bob and I am Ruth's other half. It's great to be with you this morning and we are in the process of doing a series from a most excellent book called The Bible, a story that makes sense of life by Andrew Ollerton. Highly recommended. We're doing six talks from this. And this morning, I'm going to be doing the second talk, uh, as we said, from Exodus, talking about freedom. Before I go any further, uh, Gordon is going to show us a short video, giving us an overview of this morning's theme. Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. The 
Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. As I was preparing for this talk, as so often happens, those of you who ever give talks, you'll know how much the preparation tends to speak to you uh, as you visualize your audience. The words seem to come back and challenge your own heart. Before I really begin, I just want to share a little picture that I had. I opened my Bible and I saw every single word on these two pages open here sprout like they were seeds, and each of them grew until they crowded the pages. And then they burst forth in amazing color, beautiful flowers, and then they set seed. And I saw like a breath of air just blow across them, and the seeds dispersed. And it just really, you know, in trying to close the Bible, as it were, trying to close it down with all that life inside there, it made me realize that this book is meant to be opened. And these words are meant to be spoken. And these words are meant to bear fruit. I just want to pray for you this morning that as, as I speak, uh, and I'm nobody in particular, so I don't want to get in the way of what God has to say this morning, but as I speak, uh, that, that you would hear God speaking to you, that you would hear his voice speaking to you, that you would see your part in his plan and his purposes through what we share this morning, and that in your heart you would find the strength and the courage to walk in it. 
And I particularly just want to say to those of you who are struggling this morning, God holds you in his hands. So the second of our series of talks, Gordon introduced the sessions last week talking about Genesis, origins, a human quest for meaning. It's a frustrating book because it talks a lot about what God did, the majesty, the beauty of his creation. It doesn't say a lot about how he did it. And we are built with inquisitive minds, some more than others, some more capable of exploring and opening up the how. And I'm thankful to, uh, to those scientists who can dig deep and find the awesome detail of God's creative power and translate that into something that's meaningful to mere mortals like you and I. Genesis, like our next session, Exodus, is packed with epic stories. But I was just reflecting actually about creation. I was driving up the N25, um, going out to see my parents, and it was just getting dark. And I can remember, I was listening to the planets, Hulse planets, and uh, as I crested a hill, the moon was just rising, and the combination of the moon rising and my cresting the hill meant that it came into view very quickly, and it was huge, absolutely huge. But it appeared in that way, just as that beautiful bit from the planets goes, Ta-da! And that was a ta-da moment for me that's never left me. That was years ago, and that's never going to go away. And yet that was just the moon, <laughs> all that God created. That was just the moon. When you look back from the moon and look at the earth, that's wonderful. And everything that he cast into space. Of course, the story goes on, unfortunately, to the fall. And we have incidents like Sodom and Gomorrah and Noah, the flood, and Joseph and that amazing coat. This is all stuff of Hollywood or Andrew Lloyd Webber. And this week, we move on into Exodus. Because where we leave off in Joseph, where Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers, he's now in Egypt and has found favour with the rulers of Egypt. And not only found favour, but they prosper there, and the Egyptians prosper too. There's that mutual prosperity, God's blessing on them. And that's how we leave it in Genesis. But as we enter into Exodus we find that as a new pharaoh comes on the scene, he's anxious about the influence and power of the Israelites living amongst them. And so he enslaves them, so as to contain them, so as to constrain them. It's amazing, though, isn't it, that where we started from there, that prosperity was born out of Joseph being sold into slavery, into darkness. And yet he brought beauty. God brought beauty out of that. But now there are powers that want to cramp that. And we find Moses coming before Pharaoh. Now Moses is apparently quite a timid man. I'd like to think that he didn't just say, would you mind please letting my people go? God has said to tell you this, you know, please. It's a, I, I'd like to think this is more like a lion's roar. Because there are consequences if you don't. And we see Pharaoh eventually relent after many plagues and much pain and suffering. Instead of conceding, he battles. And eventually he lets the Israelites go and as they cross the Red Sea on dry ground, isn't that amazing? It's not just the waters parted and they walked off across. If you've ever tried walking down the, uh, the estuary at low tide, you'll find it's very difficult to find any dry ground. But amazing, isn't it? The Red Sea parts and they walk across on dry ground. But then, of course, Pharaoh changes his mind. 
I guess he's lost face. You can always be careful of people who are more concerned about their image than their service. And he's concerned, and he sends his troops after them. Now, this isn't going to end well. After what we've seen of God's power already, we know this is going to end in tears, and sure enough, the waves come in, and those men on their chariots and horses are, uh, are drowned. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. Um, because actually, you know, there's so much of what we read in Genesis and Exodus, Exodus is of man being, how can I put this? Just, you know, contrary and, 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 and blowing hot and cold. God's people, God's own people here into slavery. But going back, we find this is not just God walking with his people, but God wrestling with his people. Because a bit later on, we find that those very same people, that same generation who knew that salvation, who knew that freedom, are moaning that they could actually get better food in Egypt. And they're turning to idols. And God wrestles with these people. God wrestles with his own people, but he has concern for all people. That's why it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy for Pharaoh. It's a tragedy for God's people. It's a rolling tragedy. And, you know, there are times when you do get the impression that God's just very tempted to wrap it all up. You know that there are times when he has every right to be angry. You know, when, when you think of that and you see that image of God as an angry, wrathful, vengeful God, remember the rainbows and the promises. And this is not just sweet words. You know, the rainbow says never again. The promises are a blessing from generation to generation. God has constrained his own freedom. Look at the garden. Go back to the garden. When that most awful sin was committed, when the devil, when the serpent spoke into Eve's ear and told her that God was somehow holding blessing back from her and that there was more to taste than God had given them. The attraction of that freedom the freedom to break away from the rules that God had set. That was a time, if ever there was a time, when that awful sin, the root of all sin, the root of all that we face in this world and in our own lives. And yet, instead of God casting everything into the fire, he acts with the most immense grace by casting them out of the garden. He couldn't have done anything better, and what's more, it foretells of restoration. It says he already has opened the door to a way back. You know, the words, the Lord is gracious, you know this, we've sung this many times. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that he has made. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. Those words reverberate through the Old Testament. Time and time again you will read those. And how often the people of God must have, must have reflected on God's grace and been thankful for it because of their honest assessment of their behavior. And as individuals too. There's a folly in freedom. As I say, Adam and Eve found freedom by breaking away from constraint. We have to be careful with freedom. Freedom is an interesting thing. It's a lot to do with where we come from and, and the, our reasoning behind breaking away and a lot to do also with where we go with it. If you draw a line on the ground and tell your children not to cross it, If you lay down rules and regulations for them, 
because you do it for their safety and for their care. Nevertheless, you can be pretty sure that before long they are putting their toe on that line and pushing those boundaries. And even as we grow up, we're no, we're no different. That's why God created for us a framework for freedom. It's called the Ten Commandments. It's a framework for freedom. It says, yes, I give you freedom, but you need to work within these boundaries. This is what is good for you. Okay, we know it's not perfect. We know it's just a holding operation. It's nothing like the sort of relationship that we have with God in the beginning. But it will hold things for the time being. It's a caretaker. We need that because the serpent with his weasel words is still about his business. Now, all this is a long time ago. What we read in Genesis, what we see in Exodus, it all happened a long time ago, but it's not difficult to see how it points to something else. It foreshadows something else. And for most of us, we know that what that is because we've experienced it. You know, formerly God used nobodies. Who was Abraham? Who was Moses? Who was Noah? Who were these people? He could have used important people. He could have even used Pharaoh. But he knew the character of these guys. He knew what was in their heart. They were the right people at the right time. And his spirit came upon them. But now he sends somebody in the shape of his son, not just somebody, but his most precious son, to make that once and for all sacrifice on the cross. And we enter in to a new covenant, a new agreement, freedom. We have freedom now from a tyrannical master. No longer stone tablets. The laws, and they are still there, we are under grace. But grace completes the law, fulfills the law, doesn't replace it. And those laws are now written on the fleshy tablets of our heart. So in our freedom, in our freedom, we actually still have constraints. And God works through our heart, through our mind, and through our conscience to understand those boundaries and the reasoning for them. And now we have his Holy Spirit within us. Referred there to a chosen people, a royal, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And we see that reflected too in the New Testament. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So we are called out of darkness. There's a sense of doing there as well. So what are we called to do as his people, as his holy nation, priesthood, chosen, special possession? Well, there's a lot of things we do do, and so many of you watching this morning are engaged in so many good things. But let me just tell you what God spoke to me about here. You know, when God came walking in the garden and he asked, where are you? I think I've said this to you before, you know, it wasn't a you who, it was agonized. Do you not think God knew where Adam and Eve were? He knew where they were. You know, God, when he put Adam and Eve in the garden, wasn't looking for someone to tend the plants or to look after the animals. Yes, there was that. We're called to do that, look after his creation. But there was something else. He wanted to walk with us. He wanted to walk with us in the midst of all the work that we feel called to do. He wants us to find that time to come back to the garden, to walk with him, back to that innocence. Actually, where we are now 
is actually in a more favored place than Adam and Eve. Because Adam and Eve were born into that, were created into that garden. We choose to go back there. We choose. How that must gladden the heart of God to know that we choose to be back in that garden and simply to know again that intimate relationship with him. Nothing in the way. And that's spoken to me immensely in the midst of all our busyness. Time, yes, we call it time to recharge, time to refresh, but I think it's time to get back to what God really created us for, to walk with him. Simple as that to bless his heart. Just a little bit, we, we, Ruth has mentioned we work in prisons and um, sin has consequences. Even for us today, when we make mistakes, we do things wrong, whether there's a victim or not, inevitably sin has its consequences. And sin is really just, you know, crossing those boundaries in all our freedom, crossing the boundaries and not being conscious of the good reason they're being there. And we spend time with men, and I have to put it like this to you, it's not an exaggeration to say, I look into the eyes of some men and they are in hell. They know what hell is like. For them, it is the struggle with substance abuse, it is mental health. It is remorse, actually. For some of them, they are deeply remorseful of what they've done and where they are. Sin has consequences, and we see it around us, and we see it maybe in us too at times. But when we go into prison and we talk of hope, we see eyes light up. And our freedom can speak freedom into the lives of others too. I'm just going to show you a video now, um, a video clip from HMP Exeter. I was a drug dealer. I was suffered from uh, mental health issues. I was dealing in um, uh, cannabis and amphetamines mainly. Um, and what I was making, I was using drug dispute with a fellow drug dealer um, that led to quite a serious offence. I was almost charged with attempted murder. Miraculously, they dropped the charges to aggravated burglary and threats to kill. As I was remanded into um, HMP Exeter, I was put into my cell, which was nothing new, nothing unusual. It was something that I'd been used to uh, time and time before. But for this time round, there was something different that I noticed in that prison cell and it was the Bible. As I open this Bible that I feel unusually drawn to, I feel God saying, if you want to know more about my truth, you need to start living and speaking truth. If you can imagine a man wrapped in, wrapped in chains, that was me. When I was in my prison cell all those years ago, I didn't have to be in prison to be a prisoner. I was a prisoner on the outside wrapped in all those chains of addiction, of mental health disorders. And the only thing that's changed my life outside of the prison system is the Word of God, is the Bible. So every now and then I'd be in my prison cell and I'd, I'd read a scripture and ching, one of those chains, would, one of those padlocks would just fall off and that chain would feel a little bit looser. And then a couple of days later, I'd be reading something else, somewhere else in the Bible. And ching, another padlock would fall off and that chain would feel a little bit looser until the point where my four years were up and I was walking out the doors of HMP, high point, and I was really walking out a free man because those chains were gone. But the only thing that has changed my life from what it was to what it is now is the Word of God. I haven't met Vinny, but I have had the privilege to meet many like him who have turned their lives around. Some of them now actively wanting to come back into prison to talk to inmates about their life and about that change. 
it's a powerful work. It's a wonderful thing to be part of it. How we use our freedom, you know, how you use your freedom uh, is so important, really. What we model, what we show people, hope, light into darkness. Bless you. I pray that um, what I've shared with you this morning has touched your heart. Amen. Back to Ruth. Thank you, Bob. Finney said, uh, freedom in Christ brings him back to life. The God of the Bible is a freedom fighter for us. And his word is a freedom code which will help us flourish. Should we spend a little bit of time in prayer? Thank you, God, that you bring freedom to all who turn to you. That whatever our situation or circumstance, your truth will set us free. Help us to turn to you and put our trust in you. We bring before you our failings and inadequacies, our doubts and our addictions, our fears and our anxieties this morning. Jesus, we thank you that you offer us new life, new hope, and freedom from all the things that hold us captive. Please release us now and bring us life in all its fullness. We ask that you might use us to bring freedom to others. Holy Spirit, help us to see injustice and oppression in the world. And give us the strength to speak out and work to bring change. And Lord, we thank you that when we come into relationship with you, we are to flourish within the world as you always intended. Please bring us freedom to know the truth and to live in a new way. And freedom to play out our part in your larger stories. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And we'll just lift up the whole of the justice, the criminal justice system and prisons in this country, and particularly the three in this area. This morning we do join others in prayer for those in prison. Break the bonds of fear and isolation that exist. Support with your love prisoners and their families and friends, and the prison staff, and all who care. Please heal those who have been wounded by the actions of others, especially the victims of crime. And help us to forgive one another, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly together with Christ in his strength, and in his spirit, now and every day. Amen. Shall we sing our final song together, Who You Say I Am? But he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh, it's free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am Free at last 
God of the Bible is a freedom fighter for us, remember, and his word is a freedom code which will help us flourish. Just finish with John 8. If you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We will be thinking of you all this week and we just pray a blessing on you and the peace of God in your hearts and your bodies that only God can give.